Hello everyone, today's video is a narration through some top tips, um, they're Miss Savile's tips uh, for how to really perform powerfully on paper one, question five, the creative writing question of your English language GCSE. So the first thing is to push up your vocabulary. There are certain words which are very straightforward to learn a range of more accurate synonyms for. Um, here are some examples and we call these forbidden words because what you do is you replace them. If you see them in your work, you think every time, is there a better word I could use? Sometimes you will have a word and it's simple, but it's completely correct. But other times there's no excuse for it, like bad. Bad is incredibly general. I could say I threw away some bread for the birds because it had gone bad. I could say a man stole some money from a charity box because he was bad. In one case it means gone dry and mouldy, some food, and in the other case it means a person who has a complete lack of morality. Bad is way too general. So for all of these words, one way that you can revise and improve your writing is to find a range of synonyms and learn how to spell them. And that's a very simple step of revision. You know then you're going to take those uh, more powerful words in with you and you will have opportunities to use them. Um, so for example, said, you might have whispered, shouted, uttered, replied, um, spat, um, muttered, sang, cried, responded, you know, if you can use them, they're all going to be much better. Next tip, uh, when you use a colour, use a noun to make it very precise and vivid. All of these fruits, for example, are green and they're all slightly different greens. So an olive green is a kind of brownie green and a lime green is a zingy highlighter green. An avocado green is kind of creamy and light. A uh, cucumber green is fresh and a kiwi green is kind of really kind of deep green. So if you think of maybe a fruit or an object from nature and use the noun and then the colour, it works really well. And as you can see, it's the same with blue, sapphire blue, peacock blue, ocean blue, sky blue, dolphin grey, pigeon grey, metallic grey, space grey, ruby red, cherry red, fox red, pepper red, chilli red. And you can see here, of course, that the colours are quite different. So ruby is quite rich, uh, fox is quite orangey, a cherry is what we call a blue tone red, which sounds weird. They use that term in like makeup and stuff. It means it's a kind of deeper red rather than a fiery red. So the pepper is like a fiery red. So thinking of a noun and putting it before colours, that's a really good way of making your colours vivid. Okay, so for most people, they will choose writing based on an image for their paper one, question five. So they'll get a picture and they'll describe it. And the no number one mistake they make is they just go in like a robot and just literally describe what's there. Just because you are describing and you're not doing a complicated story doesn't mean you're just like a camera. It doesn't mean that you can't have a character. So it's a good idea to always quite try to explain from the point of view of the character. So I'm going to show you an image here. Your teacher may have played you these pieces of music, but I'm going to talk you through. Um, the first piece of music is a very sad piece of piano music. When you look at this image here, in your mind you could immediately go for sympathy. And if you're going for sympathy, there's a girl, she's staring across the mist, at, it looks some fountains, some rivers, she's on a nice antique looking bench, all on her own. Maybe she's been dumped by her boyfriend, maybe she's lonely, maybe she's remembering a loved one that's passed away. If you were describing the scene with that state of mind, it would bring a lot of personality to the scene. You'd probably choose to be the person sitting there, so you wouldn't describe the girl but you describe her thoughts and what she could see. However, this piece of music was like a kind of horror movie, something's going to attack you, Jaws kind of music. And when we play this, you suddenly think of another possibility, perhaps a, a quirky, more unusual one, which is that we are watching her, but we're hidden in the bushes and watching her. Maybe we are a predator, or maybe we are a criminal waiting to jump out on her. And in that case, we would be describing her. 
But what would we be describing about her? Perhaps we'd be describing this handbag because we're waiting to jump out and steal it from her. Perhaps we are focusing on the river because we are some kind of sinister murder or something and our secret where we've hidden the dead bodies in the river and we must ensure that she, she's seen too much so we've got to silence her or something like that. You wouldn't be telling the whole story. You wouldn't be giving all of that away but your mood, your tone would be fundamentally influenced by that. And that's just two options. Um, they could, you could have a description where she is perhaps thinking about her life and she's about to leave this place. Perhaps this is where she's grown up, she's going to university and she's looking at it all tied in with her memories. But the key thing is that one of the things they expect you to do is not just be a robot and say, there is a woman, she has a bag, da, da, da. Go into it as if you, the narrator, are describing it with a personality. If you are choosing to write the story, you have to also think about that and think about who you are and where you are and never put more than one big action in your story. And so you have to have this slow pace where you're describing the setting, you're building up, creating tension and having hooks. By hooks, we mean clues, two or three clues as to what's going on before one obvious plot point. They usually don't ask you to write a whole story. They ask you to write the start of a story or maybe the end. So you have a few hooks and one event. That's plenty. But similar to if you're describing, you must think about who you are as a narrator. Okay, here are some things you can do. Whichever task you do, you can show the following things. You can show the month. Um, I, w I would normally say if it's snowing, it's January, but it's snowing and it's March. You could say the sun was blazing down from the unrelenting August sky or something like that. Or you could leave out the name of the month and you could say the dry grass had not seen the sweet rains for over two months. Yeah, so you can say whether it's summer, winter, the Christmas tree there, it's Christmas, that kind of thing. Uh, the kind of time in terms of history, you can drop in lots of hints, you know, an air raid siren wailed and it'll be in the war. Um, he looked at his new smartwatch and hurried to school and it'll be nowadays. The location, so if you were writing a story and you set it somewhere horrific like the Holocaust, you could say, um, uh, you know, you could drop in details such as um, every time their eyes cast over us we feared for our lives, you know, just dropping in little clues so you know that these people are at absolute risk. Um, the weather. Now, a lot of people do prophetic fallacy and then forget it. Well, the weather doesn't go away. If you were, for example, doing a story about somebody sat alone on a bench in the morning, it would be misty, but if they were sat there for an hour, the mist would burn off and go away and it would be bright. So if your character is there for a little while, you've got to return to the weather and show that it's changed and you can also use that as pathetic fallacy so if people are arguing and then suddenly they reach a crescendo in their argument you could add some thunder or something like that another thing that you can do which gives a sense of form and structure and a cyclical structure to your writing is have a recurring sound so if you had something like the dripping tap the cat's meow a clock wind chimes all of these things so, for example, if you were sat listening to the water trickling by and thinking about your lost love, in your last paragraph you could return to that and then maybe you're a bit more hopeful and you're listening to the water trickling by and you think it's going to the sea, it's going somewhere new, perhaps I'm going somewhere new with my life. So you kind of, you relate the first and last paragraph together. So here's an example. So if you pause and read this, I won't uh, waste time by reading it. Okay, so this is um, an opening paragraph from a short story. You've got somebody and they're returning to die, essentially. Um, we don't know this in the first paragraph, but there are a few little hooks, such as you can see that when they hear the call to prayer, they're inspired, they're stirred. And yet, they don't want to go to the mosque, or rather they can't. I wished it would be me making my way to the mosque. 
you said think, well, what's stopping them? Yeah, and then later we find out why they can't make it there. You've got the time, you've got the 6 a.m., you've got the heat already rising. So you've got a place, you've got a culture, you've got the heat already rising, you've got a sound, and you've got the person's state of mind. And then when you look at the final paragraph, not much has happened, not much can happen. This person is lying on a bed waiting for their eventual death. But there are links that make it cyclical. So straight away, it refers again to the mosque. And they're in the same place. They start lying on a straw bed and they're still on the straw bed. You, he, you find here that, you know, um, I was glad this would be my last breath. Now curled up on the humble straw bed as Delhi heat began it to relinquish its mad rage. So now it's the end of the day. The busy traffic was muted. And then just as the call to prayer opened it, as they start to pass, they start to hear the... They start, it's, it's, the, it's almost the same, same phrasing, repeated, but this time it's their death. And so that's what we mean by a cyclical structure. Yeah, in this description, the person hasn't um, moved, but our focus is on everything the same, except this time it's the evening. And of course, the evening symbolizes that they are dying. And that kind of clarifies why they're stuck there on that straw bed. Okay, other things you can do to spice up your writing. Character visuals. Zoom in on specific details, but don't be stereotypical. Uh, enough times I've read descriptions of teachers, and I think, well, what teacher is this based on? This is based on some kind of clip art of a teacher. Yeah, if you think of your teachers in this school, you have teachers of different heights. I think our, our tallest teacher is well over six foot, um, but then we have some very petite teachers. Um, we have teachers who wear bright, outrageous clothing, and we have other teachers who are, wear, they wear almost a uniform. For example, the PE teachers wear a very uh, a uniform kit. Um, so you've got all these different extremes, and you can play around with that. Don't have always that the teacher looks like someone in a grey suit. What about having a teacher with blue hair? Yeah, we've had, we have a teacher who's had blue hair here. What about having... Um, Two teachers who teach a year group and one is incredibly tall and the other is incredibly small. You've got lots of different things you could do. Zoom in on those details. What about an unusual tattoo that you wouldn't expect them to have or some unusual jewellery? Yeah, it's, don't, don't just be very, very stereotypical. So, oh, they're a goth, they've got a skull necklace. What about if they're a goth but weirdly they have a beautiful gold locket and no one knows why? And then it's a kind of mysterious little quirk, yeah? Think about that. Think of not of, of zooming in on a detail that makes your character intriguing. Uh, this is a setting tip. Um, a bit like pathetic fallacy. Can you think of an animal that reflects the mood of your setting? Obviously, they have to naturally be there. You wouldn't have like a classroom and suddenly an elephant appears in the classroom. But, for example, if you were doing something about homelessness on the streets, a stray dog. If you were doing a countryside with a field, a little mouse a beetle in a prison, some kind of little trapped insect, yeah? Um, and also with your character, if you want us to feel sorry for them, can you add something about them that makes them vulnerable? Even if they're otherwise strong, they could be like a tough guy in a prison drama, and yet they have one health problem that makes them vulnerable. They could be an urban explorer going into a, a haunted house and describing the haunted house Oh, but they're very tense because they've got no power left on their phone. Um, if we pause this, you will see the previous two methods in action. So this is just an example of the matching animal and the character with a weakness. So this is kind of a tough guy in prison, but he's got these seizures. He fears cold. He fears nothing else but only cold. Uh, and finally, you can make your narrator unreliable. Okay, if you have them repeating themselves, doubting themselves, questioning themselves. Here's another example of that. It sounds quite menacing. It sounds, and this is actually student work, it sounds quite unhinged. Yeah, it's, it, and it's just done with these questions and these contradictions. I hope these tips have been useful to you. Um, go back, pause, look at them all, and have a go at integrating them in your writing. Uh, Thanks very much and don't forget to follow for more tips.